I'm Ken Mosesian, Executive Director of the American Fertility Association, here with Dr. Jenny Mercereau at UNC Fertility to discuss ovarian reserve testing. Dr. Mercereau, what is ovarian reserve testing? Ovarian reserve is a term that we use to describe a series of tests that we have that can assess a rough estimation of the age of an ovary. So this can give us an estimation of the quantity of eggs that are left and the quality of the eggs that are left. And we often do these tests before doing fertility treatments to give us a rough estimate on how people will respond to the treatments and their chance of pregnancy. Can you discuss age as a factor in uh, ovarian reserve? So age is always a factor when we talk about fertility in general. However, ovarian reserve specifically can be dissociated or separate from the age factor alone. So for example, traditionally older women have lower ovarian reserve. That being said, younger women sometimes have tests that show us that their ovaries may be acting older than their chronologic age. And the flip is true. Sometimes we do these same types of tests in older women and their test results seem rather reassuring, which may indicate that their ovaries are at least not acting older than their chronologic age, but in fact maybe kind of on par with their age. Can ovarian reserve be tested? And if so, what does that tell us about the quality and the quantity of eggs? So we do have tests that can give us a rough estimation of ovarian reserve. Um, these tests are thought to be markers of the number of eggs that are left, so in a sense the quantity of eggs, as well as the quality of eggs. So even in women who have eggs, they ovulate every month, the quality of the eggs might be lower than one would expect, meaning that the chance of actually having a pregnancy from those eggs is less likely. Doctor, can you talk about when ovarian reserve testing should be done and what it can tell us? So ovarian reserve testing is often done when patients present for a visit for infertility evaluation. Um, usually this is done after a couple or an individual has been trying to get pregnant and is having trouble. So often we'll do it at the time that they present for their first visit. Uh, however, we usually insist on having it done before they start active fertility treatments like insemination or in vitro fertilization. In general, these tests are not thought to be fertility tests in general for couples that are just starting to try to get pregnant since we aren't really sure what to make of the results in people who aren't infertile. Dr. Mercero, can you tell us a little bit more about what types of tests are used? There are several types of tests that we have to assess ovarian reserve. Um, the classic one is to do a blood test called FSH, and we usually do that in conjunction with another blood test called estradiol or estrogen. Um, the combination of those two tests should be done right after the menstrual period starts. So traditionally we do it from cycle day two, three, or four, with cycle day one being the first day of the period. And what does the uh, acronym FSH stand for? FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. It's a hormone that the brain secretes to tell the ovary to make an egg. The other test that is a newer test that we have to look at ovarian reserve is a blood test called AMH, or anti-mullerian hormone. This blood test is um, different in that you can do it on any day of the menstrual cycle, so it's a lot easier to schedule and um, perform this blood test. Could you discuss this a little bit further, particularly uh, the accuracy of the tests, the costs, and uh, the clomiphene challenge? Yes, so these tests are used in general to predict one's response to fertility treatments. So they're not perfect tests. The exact accuracy is actually not great, but they can give us an idea if the ovaries might be acting older than one's age, meaning you may not respond as well to fertility treatments as somebody else of your same chronologic age. Um, the cost 
is hard to hard to give you an exact amount. Um, sometimes these tests are covered by insurance. Sometimes they're not. If they're not covered, they're probably in the order of one to two hundred dollars for a test. The clomiphene challenge test is an older test. It involves also the same blood test, FSH and estradiol, but we do it on two separate occasions, on cycle day three, and then also again on cycle day 10, after a patient has taken a round of Clomid. However, this test is more involved. It involves a visit, two visits, and a, um, taking medication, and it hasn't been shown to be any better than just doing a single FSH and estradiol test or the AMH. So this test has not been used as much in recent years. Can you talk uh, about what the numbers mean in these tests, um, particularly the ranges? Sure, so traditionally the FSH blood test is a test where a high number is worse. So each lab has slightly different cutoffs for what is considered normal and abnormal and you should talk with your own doctor about the way that your specific lab works, but in general, a higher number with FSH above 10 or above 12 is a sign that the ovaries may be acting older. Um, AMH, on the other hand, uh, is the reverse, so a low number is a sign that the ovaries are acting older, and in general, the test should be above one when it drops below one, that's a sign that the ovaries are acting older. What if someone's experiencing a, a variance in these numbers from month to month? Does that mean something significant is happening? In general, we like to say that you're only as, your ovaries are only as good as your worst lab value. So we don't recommend testing over and over and over on a very regular basis to check these numbers. Um, in general, the kind of the worst number that is shown for an individual patient is the most predictive of their response to fertility treatments. That being said, we'll often um, do the same test maybe once a year if somebody's under our care for a prolonged period of time to just get a sense over time of how the numbers look. Are these tests effective at predicting one's ability to become pregnant? That's a great question. These tests have been studied in a way that they evaluate one's response to fertility treatments specifically. So there's data to suggest that FSH and AMH predict the number of eggs that we can get with IVF and the, um, the number of embryos that we can create or, chance of preg um, or response to treatments for insemination. Pregnancy itself is a difficult thing to use these numbers at. Um, to predict. So to date we don't usually rely specifically on ovarian reserve testing as a predictor of chance of pregnancy from fertility treatments. There's a lot of other factors that can play into the chance of pregnancy from fertility treatments and specifically looking at numbers like this would not be of benefit to our patients. Dr. Mercero, what are the other tests necessary to help determine one's chances of getting pregnant? There's a whole bunch of tests that we can do to look at a whole bunch of factors. So ovarian reserve is one aspect that we usually look at. However, we also like to look at sperm counts for the partner. We often will check to see if the fallopian tubes are functioning appropriately, and we often will use a test like a hysteris salpingogram for that. Um, also, we'll often do a transvaginal ultrasound to get a better sense of the uterus and ovaries and make sure that there's no pathologic problem or abnormality on those organs. Can testing for uh, ovarian reserve help one avoid hyperstimulation syndrome? It's a great question. So ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is a, briefly is a condition that can occur when one uses injection medications to make the ovaries make a bunch of eggs on a given month. And some patients can be what we call high responders and occasionally there's this syndrome where the ovaries make way too many eggs and it can be uncomfortable and cause other problems. Sometimes if the ovarian reserve testing shows very robust ovarian reserve, we may decide to start with fertility treatments at a low dose to try to avoid a potentially serious condition called ovarian, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. If someone's a poor responder, what are their other possibilities? 
So if somebody is a poor responder, that can be determined based on ovarian reserve testing or specifically their response to fertility treatments. So if they try fertility treatments and they really don't make a significant number of eggs um, and we think their chance of pregnancy is low, sometimes we can try a different type of protocol. Alternately, sometimes we talk about other options such as donor egg IVF, which involves having a young, usually a young woman, produce eggs um, with an IVF procedure, take them out, fertilize them with the partner's sperm, and then the woman recipient female carries the pregnancy. The chance of pregnancy with donor egg IVF is dramatically different, much better than trying to get a pregnancy in someone who has what we call poor ovarian reserve. Also, options like adoption of a child is an op or options available for people who have poor ovarian reserve. Dr. Mercero, in general, how do you feel that ovarian reserve testing can help women who are having difficulty becoming pregnant? So ovarian reserve testing currently is not especially precise and predictive of chance of pregnancy. Um, however, I think that the test is the tests are evolving and in the hopefully near future we have better tests that are more predictive of response to fertility treatments and ultimately pregnancy from fertility treatments. Um, I think that these are currently useful tests and they're only going to become more and more useful in helping young women and couples achieve their goals in terms of family building. Thank you very much. Thank you.